I'm Norm Sleep. I'm professor of geophysics at Stanford. Now, Norm, you are primarily known as an Earth scientist. Can you tell me about your journey? Uh, where did you grow up, and how did you just become an Earth scientist? I grew up in Kalamazoo, Michigan. It's a glaciated area. Uh, outcrops are extremely rare, uh, but the glacier has brought everything down from the north. Uh, so uh, uh, fossils from the uh, coral reefs that were in present in Michigan uh, uh, several hundred million years ago, and billion-year-old rocks from the Canadian Shield like granites were very uh, common. <laughs> so that's how you got interested uh, in rocks. I, I got interested in rocks. I had the good fortune to be in the Boy Scouts where we had a trip to the western U.S. We arrived at Yellowstone right after the 1959 earthquake. Uh, geysers that hadn't gone off in the last 50 years were going off. Crystal Pool was full of mud. I suddenly realized that the earth was active uh, and not just something that had sat there, and that tweaked my interest more. Okay. <laughs> now, so that so growing up around rocks and then having this earthquake and then Crystal Pool and then going to Yellowstone. Yeah. Now, how about astrobiology? Uh, and at that time, I was living in the Bible Belt of Michigan. Um, I didn't know uh, Belt, Michigan had a Bible Belt. It's too far north, I would have thought. Uh, no, it does. It's southwestern Michigan. It's mainly of uh, Dutch reform. I see. Uh, uh, but it's very uh, biblical. And, uh, so we had no evolution at all in ninth grade biology and 12th grade biology. They had a book. It took Herculean efforts to write the book. The very thin chapter on evolution had no connection with any other biology. Wow. And none of the other rest of the book had any connection with evolution. So the teacher announced at the beginning of this she had no opinion of evolution whatsoever. What year was this? Uh, this would be uh, 1962. Okay. It's after Darwin. <laughs> and uh, so I started to press her, and then I stopped suddenly. Why? Uh, uh, I realized that she'd given a ringing endorsement of Darwin, uh, that anything more positive about evolution and her job would have been over by nightfall. Whoa. Because of the conservative parents yeah, of the Yeah, very conservative area. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and so... Now, what does that have to do with your interest in astrobiology? I would have thought that would have put a damper on it, but you being it a heretic... temporarily put a damper on any interest I had in biology. Up to that moment, I had no idea I'd be any good at uh, research science. My ambition went to being a high school math or science teacher, and not beyond that, suddenly I was driven to avoid that fate. <laughs> The fate of being a high school biology teacher. teacher and having to put up with all this duplicity. Oh, right, in Michigan. But you could have gone to a place where it was more enlightened. I could have, but I was uh, 17 years old. Okay, all right. Uh, so I went to Michigan State. Uh, biology at that time was kind of a gatekeeper class for the pre-meds. A lot of memory, uh, very little science. I had interest in geology. I took that. I realized very soon that a lot was known about what had happened in geological time, uh, but very little was known on how it happened as physics. Uh, we had a relatively liberal department at Michigan State, so continental drift was treated as a testable hypothesis rather than an abomination. Okay. And, uh, well, good for Michigan. Uh, good for Michigan. <laughs> I, got, I knew I had to get the basic math and physics, chemistry, which I did. Uh, I enrolled in MIT, and then plate tectonics suddenly fell on my lap. Now, MIT played a big role in this. Uh... A big role. And kind of the thing, the senior faculty were gone uh, to the moon program. Oh. So the younger people had to kind of run the scientific revolution in part. Okay. And we had a conference at Woods Hall, September, just before classes started. 
there had been a big research program in the Atlantic to see if CIFAR spreading actually occurred. Mm -hmm. uh, by the third talk, it was evident that CIFAR spreading was basically correct. And uh, by the end of the conference, it was very evident to me uh, that the physics of why things were occurring, uh, the plate tectonics came a couple years later. But wait, you're talking about plate tectonics. What does that have to do with astrobiology? Uh, there's some, it gets into the physics of how planets works. It gets it, if you understand how the Earth works, you can export it to the early Earth. Uh, you could hopefully export it to other planets. I see. At this point, it did not have a connection uh, to me. It became evident very quick that the moon is very dead, inhospitable mm. uh, planet. The idea that it records uh, the impact of asteroids over geologic time, the, their asteroids aren't being stirred, the moon is small, the earth is big. If you're in a forest full of junk and hunters, uh, the deer is much like more likely to be shot than the rabbit. <laughs> okay. No more physics than that. Okay. But, well, uh, and uh, kind of students were not particularly encouraged uh, to work on things related to the moon because uh, NASA was treating things as a private club at that time. But you, that's when you became interested in the moon? I became slightly interested in the moon even though I couldn't work on it. So, but you didn't come up with the impact hypothesis, did you? That goes way back. Uh, I think Bob Dietz was the first person mm -hmm. to uh, push it in modern times, but it, it existed way back. But, but I, I think the first time I came across a paper of yours was like in 1989, you wrote a paper like, how big does an object have to be if it hits the Earth at a, some normal velocity, would it kill all life? Yes. That, you, that was a paper that you wrote that said, whoa, that's an interesting question. So how big does an object have to be to hit uh, the Earth? Somewhere between 300 and 500 kilometers. 300 kilometers to boil off the ocean or leave the rest of the brine in the ocean so Three hot. to 500. That, now, how many such objects do you think have hit the Earth from, let's say, from, I guess, 4.5, 6, 7 billion years ago till today? There's the boot farming impact, which is a... A Mars size object. Yeah, but that's much bigger. I'm talking about smaller ones. Since then, maybe one, you can count them on your hands, maybe zero. Why not 10? Um, I don't think you, if the objects are relatively equal size, you very quickly get to the point where the moon would get wiped out. About one in 20 objects will hit the moon. And if you have a lot of objects hitting the Earth, you'll have objects hitting the moon that are bigger than the largest object that we know we know hit the moon. Well, but the, okay, well, anyway, uh, how long have you been at Stanford? Uh, since uh, 1979. And do you teach any courses that are vaguely related to I astrobiology? I taught a non-major astrobiology class. Uh, we have seminars where things come up, but we don't have a formal uh, class now in astrobiology taught by me. What's the closest thing to astrobiology at Stanford? It's scattered, unfortunately, between many departments. They're starting to set up uh, space science, astrobiology, uh, consortium with people in different departments. Mm. Uh, but we, we still have this unfortunate arrangement uh, that different people are in different departments. Uh, most of the people are doing the physics and chemistry of the other planets rather than directly astrobiology. Now, here we are in the Earth Sciences Department, and I noticed that by talking to Earth scientists, some of them are interested in the effects of life on Earth, and others just, no, I don't care about life. They want to pretend that life doesn't even exist on Earth. Now, do, do you, obviously you're interested in astrobiology, you're interested in the effects of life on the Earth. You pick up a rock, this is a, a, a lava that's come up from the interior of the earth. We need to raise yeah, up the rock so it can be right. uh, seen. They're pieces of the mantle of the earth. Uh -huh. Now if we analyze this rock very carefully, analyze uh, isotopes of rare elements, 
we will probably see the effects of life uh, where there's been uh, dead life uh, that's gone into the earth and the subduction zone's gone down very deep in the battle and uh, uh, pieces of this material are incorporated in very trace amounts uh, but we could see the effects. If we take a normal mid-ocean ridge basalt uh, we could see the biological effects of uranium isotopes uh, on uh, what gets subducted into the mantle and what stays up in the crust. But you have olivine there mixed in basalt. Those are xenoliths. So those xenoliths cannot have gone very down very deep. I mean, they didn't start very deep, and therefore you're probably only looking at life within the last, what, 500 million or a billion, nothing older than that, right? If we get lucky, we can go out and look at places where metal plumes have come up uh, from very deep. Uh, some of this material may have been part of a metal plume once. But the metal plumes, they're very deep, but would they see evidence for life in them, as you described? Yeah, you do see in Hawaii, you can see subducted manganese nodules. Subducted manganese nodules, and manganese nodules are only produced if there's life? They're only produced if there's life. They're only produced if the ocean is oxic. Uh -huh. So they've had to be produced in the last 1.85 billion years. I thought the GOE, oh, the GOE, I thought it was 2.3. Yeah, after the, but the deep ocean doesn't become uh -huh. oxic into the time of the Sudbury impact at 1.85. Oh, okay. So they form in the deep ocean. But I asked you this question about have you been trying to get Earth scientists more interested in the effect of life on Earth and therefore closer to astrobiology? Uh, definitely. Uh, uh, we published a paper that was provocatively entitled Paleontology of Earth's Mantle. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, that uh, the typical geologist is uh, trained to study a hard rock uh, is not the typical <clears throat> geologist that's trained to study a fossil. Oh. And uh, so the biological effects that you see in the mantle get treated as oddities. Uh, they don't get treated as evidence of last resort on life on the early Earth. Right. Now, I know people are looking for fossils. They're looking for fossils, and they go back 3.5. But you're talking about, what, isotopic evidence for isotopic life? Isotopic evidence. Inside mantle. Now, does that go even, usually the isotopic evidence goes earlier than the fossil evidence. Is that the case? Can you get earlier than 3.5 isotopic evidence? We can get well earlier than 3.5. We see diamonds uh, with nitrogen isotopes uh, that are appropriate for organic matter that was subducted. Uh, before the great oxidation event. When you say appropriate for matter, you mean the 14 to 15 ratio has been changed by life? The 14 to 15 ratio gets changed by life, and just because of the way the fractionation works, the sign of the fractionation differs before than after the great oxidation event. Okay, but we're talking about life without oxygen, and we're and talking life, about well, life, with life that's fractionating nitrogen, what, 3 or 3.5 billion years you ago? Got, there's life uh, that does photosynthesis uh, where it makes organic carbon and it can either make, uh, take sulfide, like would be a hydrogen sulfide or iron sulfide in solution for pyrite, solid iron pyrites, and turn it into sulfate, or uh, just let me pause for okay, a second. Pause. If I could hear a metal block, just uh, <laughs> I'll cut this off. All right. All right. We can go to another question if you'd like. I, I know if I'm. Uh, so I could take uh, uh, the sulfide and turn it into sulfate. You have to hold it up to. Hold we'll it hold it up here. Yeah. This is 3.8 billion years old. That's 3.8 billion. Yeah, Where is that from? It's from Ishua, it was a black shale at one time. Black shale, okay. It's been repeatedly heated to 500 degrees C, uh -huh. but the carbon isotopes still remain. So you have a 12 to 13 ratio that is higher than uh, in meteoritic. Meteoritic or average earth, uh -huh. or in carbonates. And so therefore you know that there was life doing that fractionation. And we can see uh, uh, the pyrites uh, uh, where the uh, sulfur 
sulfate in the water was reduced by some of the organic matter, formed uh, pyrites and formed carbon dioxide that went back in the ocean. Well, let me stop you there and ask you, let's suppose that there was no life on Earth. How, what type of place would it be? How, what's the biggest difference between what we see today and what would we see today if there had been no life? What's uh, we, the biggest effects that life has had? Uh, one of the biggest effects may be that life uh, causes weathering. The, uh, this rock is a, it's a shale that's composed of basically fine-grained silicon dioxide, uh, but the silicon dioxide and the clays and shale ultimately come from weathering of rocks on land. Life greatly speeds up the weathering, so we'd have a much wait, slower on, rock on, cycle. Wait, 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 and we it speeds up the weathering on land. Land. But what if there would, maybe there'd be no land? Uh, there might be, there'd be, uh, there might be uh, no big continents uh, built up because it becomes a lot harder uh, to have the weathered uh, rocks here, products of weathered rocks here like this uh, shale that can get remelted to form a granite. And granites are kind of... Uh, what hold up the continents. Now, now, let me get this straight. You're saying that life increases erosion. Increases now, erosion. But, but I have a garden, and there's, when there's roots, that they stop the erosion. They stop the erosion, but they cause the chemical decay. Eventually, when push comes to shove, uh, the, uh, your garden will erode over a long geological period of time. It will erode as weathered rocks rather than pieces of unweathered granite or whatever you have around in your garden. Well, it would, Earth wouldn't be like, uh, like the moon, I guess. It would be more like Venus if there was no uh, life? Uh, you, you'd still have weathering of basalt. You'd, you'd have some granites, but less. Because when you say weathering, do you mean mostly due to the hydrological cycle? The, hydrolog the life greatly speeds up the chemical decomposition of rocks in the hydrological cycle. Now what life, are we talking about uh, lichen here? Are we talking about bacteria, archaea? Uh, bacteria, archaea, anything that happens to be around. Uh, the early Earth, uh, uh, we have also, we have the sulfide uh, photosynthesis. We also have the photosynthesis that will take ferrous iron and turn it into ferric iron, basically make rust. Again, we have the back reaction, the ferric iron will react with organic matter, and we're back to CO2 and ferrous iron. If we're in the ocean, there's a lot of ferrous iron around, a lot of sulfide around. Uh, the microbe gets the sunlight, uh, finds the CO2. It doesn't have any problem making or get, getting the building box to make organic carbon. If you're on land, uh, you weather the rock, you end up uh, with a rock cycle. Uh, this rock, even though it looks black, the minerals in it are mainly silicon, hold it, hold it up there. silicon dioxide. Uh huh. Not much clay. Yeah. If there was clay in it, we'd have garnets as uh, big as my head, and we wouldn't be able to see anything in the rock. But uh, wait, let, this is, imagine there was no life on Earth. Would that rock exist? Uh, uh, we certainly would not have a rock that had concentrated carbon in it. Uh, we would not have ro rock with a strong sulfur cycle. So you're saying that life has concentrated the carbon. We would not have the separation of iron from magnesium. Uh -huh. uh, we have rocks like iron formation. You have a lot of that in Australia. Uh, where it, it's, there's a ferric iron in it that makes it red, there's ferrous iron, uh, but very little magnesium. Now, a lot of the things you're talking about are chemical, and they're hard to see remotely. But let's suppose that we are aliens, and we're, let's say we're on a planet around Alpha Centauri. We're looking at Earth, and we have very good telescopes. We can see high resolution. We can see the, the light tr going through that. We have transit uh, spectroscopy of light from the sun going through our atmosphere. How are we going to, as aliens, to detect life on Earth? We would see the oxygen first. Now, but uh, I've heard that oxygen can also be produced abiotically. For example, H2O being dissociated in the upper atmosphere by UV. That doesn't make much of it. Uh, if there's a lot of H2O and it gets up there, it would make a lot. 
Uh, there's generally a coal trap at the base of the stratosphere, at the top of the clouds. Now that cold trap has nothing to do with life. Nothing to do with life. If life was not here, we'd still have a cold trap. We'd still have a cold trap. It becomes very hard uh, to get water high enough in the atmosphere that it photolytically dissolves. We have a little bit. We've lost me like tens of meters off the top of the ocean over geological history. This oxygen, there's very little of it. It'll very quickly react with the uh, with pyrites or act with the uh, ferrous iron or the basalt, and it cannot build up to high quantities. We have uh, about 21% oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, if we did not have any more photosynthesis, this would be used up within a billion, a million, not billion years. So it would, it, this large amount of oxygen in a planet that is at a distance from the star uh, where it's habitable, where it's climate. Uh, there's no good way that we know of to build it up without life. And people have taken considerable effort to have things that would be false positive. But if we have something like Venus, uh, you can build up an oxygen atmosphere, but you know it's close to the star and extremely hot, and we could check life off the list to what are the causes. But, but oxygenic photosynthesis is what you're talking about. The early photosynthesis was not oxygenic, right? Right, and we would not be able to use that technique. Well, how about the, if you use H2S? I mean, let's suppose that we have visited many, many, many planets with life. What fraction of them will be oxygen, and they can turn photons into energy? I mean, turn into... I, photosynthesis evolves very early on the Earth. This rock is 3.8 billion years old. It's one of the oldest rocks we actually have. Photosynthesis, probably both the iron type and the sulfur type have evolved by them. Okay, so let's we say... We know it evolves quickly. Okay, so let's talk about that type of photosynthesis. What are they doing to the atmosphere that might be remotely detectable? Uh, we would get methane in the atmosphere. Meth from the, but not from this photosynthesis. Ultimately, from the photosynthesis, that the de you decay organic matter, you get swap gas, which is methane. If you decay organic matter, so you're saying, okay, we have, I'm, I'm confused here. We're having, you're saying that the photosynthetic things, whatever the they're doing, they're carbon based. It produces organic matter, it uh. produces uh, uh, sulfate, which will stay in solution, it produces ferrous iron that's insoluble. Okay. Uh, we have microbes that could eat uh, the ferric iron and the organic matter and turn it back into CO2 and ferrous iron. All right, let's stop. I'm going to stop you there. Let's summarize. I'm going to try to remotely detect life through its gases in the atmosphere. What do you think are the, the best biosignature gases that we should be looking for? I would put oxygen first, but if we don't have oxygenated photosynthesis, we're not going to find it. Okay. Uh, I put methane uh, second. Because? Uh, because what organic matter rots uh, anaerobically, uh, uh, methane is produced, and we could get a lot more methane by orders of magnitude than the methane we get from abiotic sources. And you say rot. Tell me about the word rots. Uh, uh, you have or organic matter that's very complicated compounds. Yes. Uh, uh, it, it contains oxygen, it contains hydrogen, it contains carbon, if we're going to be very simple. Yes. Uh, uh, the, uh, usually the most the thermodynamically stable compounds are methane and CO2. Uh, a microbe will take the organic matter, uh, it'll probably, it may just take organic matter by taking sugar, uh, into uh, CO2 and alcohol, uh, but if, if you have different types of microbes that have different abilities, uh, what push comes to shove, uh, you'll eventually end up with uh, CO2 and methane in whatever, whatever about a hydrogen and oxygen you start with in the rock. But 
but H2O, NH3, CH4, and CO2, these are things that are very common in comets. We don't imagine that that has been put there by life, and yet you're saying methane can be used as a biosignature. Presumably you mean if you see um, yeah, methane much higher than we would expect it. Abiotically. If you get a little bit of it, you're going to get that abiotically. We get abiotic methane on the Earth. Occasionally, somebody claims that methane that we get in natural gas uh, as coming out of the interior of the earth. Yes. Uh, if, you, if you get a, a big tank of methane, uh, a tiny amount of it is, but it's not affect uh, the, uh, best, uh, the cash balance of an oil company. Okay, but on the other hand, methane also on a rocky planet is something that comes to the surface. So I have a, let's say I have an earth mass full of cometary material, it will differentiate, all of the light ices will come to the surface, and at certain temperatures, methane is very, very prominent in the atmosphere, it's, like, it's, like in Jupiter, I don't know, Titan, for example, right? Titan. Uh, we, uh, Titan, if there's more than one planet orbiting the star, we could quickly get the gravitational effect of one planet on the orbit of the other. No. This is done routinely now. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we know the mass of the planet, if we're lucky enough, the Alpha Centauri is lined up uh, with the plate of the ecliptic, which it's not, but right. if we, we wait 30,000 years, it will be. Uh, and astronomers on Alpha Centauri, if they wait 30,000 years, will be able to see the Earth transit at the sun. Uh, they will know that... Wait, 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 we're talking about methane in an atmosphere at b biological levels as a biosignature above the, some they abiotic. Will know, they will know the Earth is made mainly of rock uh, that's quite right. dense right, right. Uh, rather than ice, which is not dense. Right, but that's, not my, get, that's not my question. My question is we have something like Titan or even Jupiter. There's lots of methane, and we don't think it was produced by life. Agreed. So but we know so that the, Titan do, has a very low density, uh, so that most of the planet is I see. Uh, it's made basically out of something you could find in a comet. So, so we're going to use the density yes. of the planet to figure out whether it sh should have a lot of volatiles, and if it's a very high density, it shouldn't, and yet we see it, then methane becomes a biosignature. It becomes a biosignature not as good as oxygen. Okay, so we need the density of the planet as well then. If we have good astronomy, uh, we could s see uh, uh, the change in the reflectance of the planet depending on whether we have leaves uh, from the trees or not. This okay. is not easy to do. If you look at life reflected from the moon, the, you see the crest of the moon, you see the earth shine. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, at technology of value, available to Galileo and probably to Pliny, uh, you could tell whether the moon is over an ocean or over yes, yes. the Sahara Desert, just because the moon is brighter when it's, the earth shine is brighter when it, right, right. if we get a sensitive instrument, which Galileo did not have, what at the detailed spectra of the light reflecting off the moon, uh, we could see that the, uh, the absorption and reflection bands. We can see leaves are green. Okay. Now, I want to ask you another question about life. Um, now, if life, suppose life does get started on other planets. Now, here we are on Earth, and we would, don't, do you agree that we should look at the most fundamental aspects of life on Earth and then use those as our best guesses about what the life elsewhere would be? Uh, we obviously have to start with something kind of a bad word, primitive, but something that's retained a lot of its early characteristics. We, uh, that one-celled life has also had four billion years to evolve just like us. But we could find uh, features if we compare different organisms, uh, look at their DNA, look at their molecular structure uh, that appear to be uh, very conservative. We could see that life uses nickel and cobalt, uh, which means that rocks of battle type were probably around where these were abundant uh, when this life was evolving. 
our vitamin B12 has cobalt in it. Well, for example, there's a distinction among at least uh, multicellular eukaryotes between fungi, animals, and plants. Do you think that type of trichotomization of multicellular organisms we would exist there too? Kind of for jobs that are done if we reach multicellular life, but uh, uh, this is a pneumulites that hung out at the great, around the Great Pyramids about 50 million years ago before the pyramids were built. Again, coming from Michigan, I have to say that. Okay. <laughs> and okay. uh, this is a single cell foraminifera. It's okay. quite big. Sing but it's a eukaryote, single cell eukaryote. It's a single cell eukaryote, but a big one. So there are foraminifera that eat animals. There's no ladder of life. Uh huh. Okay. Big but foraminifera this big that's not photosynthetic, will eat small oh, okay. animals. Okay, well, let me be a little bit more basic. Do you think we sh you think eukaryogenesis, the formation of eukaryotes, is something that you expect on other planets? It's conceivable, but it's occurred in a very weird way. Uh, with modern genomics, there's what's called Asgard archaea, Loki archaea. Uh, they've only recently been discovered, uh, but they're... Uh, Genomics is very similar to the core genomics of eukaryotes. Yes, yes. Uh, so we have this archaea that manages to grab uh, various things, but it, it grabs a purple sulfur bacteria. Right. Uh, at the time, the Earth's probably anoxic. The purple sulfur bacteria can do photosynthesis. Yes. Uh, so it's acting as an anoxygenic sulfur photosynthesizing chloroplasts if you want to do it in terms of jobs. Right, but I'm more interested in the fundamental thing of endosymbiosis. Do you expect that to be something so fundamental that we should expect life elsewhere to do it? We expect life elsewhere to do it, but we don't know whether that's going to lead to the complex life. It certainly helped to the complex life here. Uh, we have very complicated, large, one-celled organisms uh, so uh, there are able for some of the big ones reproduce sexually just like a higher I don't like the word higher but multicellular eukaryotes mm -hmm. uh, we okay. have multicellular organisms if we take cyanobacteria uh, it has some varieties of it has special uh, cells that can fix nitrogen uh -huh. we're starting to get different cell types uh, the uh, program cell death exists in one cell microbes. Yes, yes. Our hair up here, the hair, you go to the barber shop, you cut your hair, it doesn't hurt. The, uh, the hair is de made out of dead right. cells. Okay. Okay. They're programmed to die. Let me ask you about the carbonate silicate cycle. Now, it's often cited as an abiotic negative feedback mechanism on the temperature of the earth. What is your understanding of that and do you agree with that or how abiotic is it? It's not really abiotic. The biology helps with the weathering. By a factor of? A factor of a few, probably. Okay. Uh, the uh, uh, biology determines where the uh, calcium carbonate ends up. Let's look uh, for a second here. Uh, here uh, we have a. Hold it up, please. A uh, piece of calcium carbonate. Uh, the calcium carbonate is precipitated uh, by shell-making organisms. Some of these are multicellular. Uh, some of these, like this, are one cellular. I can't see. I can't see it. Hold it up. There you. Oh, I see. Okay. And uh, uh, we right now on the Earth we have uh, pelagic organisms that live out in the middle of the ocean, do photosynthesis. When they die, their calcium carbonate shells sink to the bottom of the ocean. If you go to the ocean near the equator where they're particularly active, the whole seafloor is covered with recently dead calcium carbonate precipitating organisms. These organisms did not live on the earth in any abundance until about uh, 200 million years ago, and they've only been abundant in the last 100 million or so. Uh, we ha so how long has this carbonate silicate cycle been able to regulate the temperature of the Earth? Uh, uh, probably 
uh, someone in a sense we see life uh, mostly in the last like two and a half billion years. Okay, before that. We the... have carbonate reefs starting at about 2.9 billion they progressively become more and more abundant. So you would agree that you could not have this abiotic thermal regulation before about that time? Well we had biotic regulation, the rocks still weather reduce, produce calcium but the calcium carbonate ends up uh, in the basaltic rocks here which are the uh, black rock around the green rock uh -huh. when that weathers on the seafloor and so we're still getting a cycle, we're just not getting the white cliffs of Dover. I see. Okay, now, um, have you talked to Lovelock or Margulis? I never knew Lo Lovelock. Uh, Margulis was a frequent visitor to Northwestern, so I knew her. And you were at Northwestern? Uh, for six years on the faculty. Oh, I see. And how did you, what did you think of her stuff? I don't like her five kingdoms, but her endosymbiosis I found very persuasive. Okay. Now, uh, there's a book that she wrote with uh, Harding, a chapter actually, with Harding about, uh, it's, I think they called it Water Gaia, and the idea was that uh, life somehow does something to keep the surface of the, wa of the earth wet. Now, is there, are there any ideas about that that make any sense to you? Could life, for example, if you, had, if you wanted to prevent water from evaporating, I guess you could put some kind of thin, oily film out there or something. Or maybe you could control the clouds somehow or the albedo. Or What do you think of this idea of water Gaia? Uh, a lot of the cloud nuclei are uh, biological, so dead you, organisms. So do you think there are that... organisms that live in clouds, right. not enough to make the clouds green. Right, but how about enough to control the albedo of the Earth? Uh, they affect the weathering. If we start uh, with this uh, black basalt, uh, uh, the Arabs in Arabia, where they were crossing a field of basalt, Lawrence of Arabia is factually correct there. They cross it with the cavils at night because the uh, uh, black basalt would absorb all the sunlight and it would be unbearable to cross during the height of the day. Right. Uh, and so if we weather basalt, it becomes progressively whiter. If we weather extensively, make clays uh, that melt and become granites. The granites weather, we get white quartzite and we get a white sand desert like the Sahara or the deserts in Australia which are very reflective. Right, but they, they are now a thermostat for the Earth. During the Ice Age, the Sahara Desert uh, was covered with vast lakes, vast forests. Uh, it was very absorbent of light. Uh, when the Ice Age ended, it progressively became drier. Yeah. Drier, the lakes dried up, the civilizations pretty well vanished. Uh, the forest died off, and we ended up with this very reflective quartz sand desert. All right, but you say the Ice Age, is, does that have anything to do with life? Does life have anything to do with the Milankovitch cycles? It doesn't affect the Milankovitch cycles, but it, mod it enhances the effect. Now, when I look at the Earth from outer space, I see, I guess, about 30% of it covered with clouds. And I'm thinking, I'm asking myself, what fraction of those clouds are made by Earth? If there was no life there, but there was water, would it be 100% clouds or 50% clouds or 10% clouds? I mean, what controls that 30%? We probably get less clouds. Water gets remobilized. You take a tree, yes. the rain falls, the tree it goes evapotranspiration. Let's go back a billion years before there are trees. Uh, you would have microbes that would do the same job less effectively. You would have microbial mats probably covering uh, the entire continents except for it was very dry. Well, you're suggesting that life uh, enhances the amount of clouds that a planet will have? Yes. By a factor of? Uh, 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 probably not double it, but... Uh, is there a way to measure that? Can you think of a way to measure the life's ability? You can keep track from isotopes down on the modern Earth. 
uh, with oxygen and hydrogen isotopes. Uh, if you have rain, let's say in the center of Australia now, or you're, yeah, okay. while we're recording, you're getting fires. If it rains there, we can record whether that moisture has come directly from the ocean I see. or it's come from evapotranspiration. I see. Uh, we don't, on the modern Earth, we get desert microbial mats. Mm -hmm. uh, these affect the albedo. Right. Uh, the Israeli Egyptian border is easily visible from the moon with the naked eye. The which Egyptian border? Israeli Israel Egyptian oh, border yes, on yes, Sinai. Yes, I've seen that. I've seen that. It's much darker, and therefore the albedo the, the, uh, is the Israeli side. Uh, is the Israelis restrict goat grazing. Oh. Uh, so the this desert uh, a mat which contains eukaryotes as well as and microbes builds up in the desert, it's dark. Okay. On uh, the Egyptian side, goat grazing gets not as regulated and it all gets eaten and we're back to a highly reflective quartz sand desert. Okay. There were no goats in, in the Archaean or the Proterozoic uh, to eat the mat. There would still be uh, microbes that would eat, eat or eat the, either the live or dead photosynthetic okay. microbes uh, but we would still have this uh, bath that would be uh, uh, less uh, reflective. Now, I seem to remember that in a paper with Rosing, you, uh, you talked about trying to solve the faint early sun paradox by saying there weren't any clouds and the ocean had a There'd much... There'd be fewer clouds. Why? Uh, Why fewer clouds? Uh, you don't have the biological material to nucleate them. So you're saying that biology does produce, pro, have a very strong role in producing clouds? Yes. Is that be more so in the early Earth? Uh, uh, once we, uh, it probably has more of a role now because it's much easier to get fragments of organic matter. We have much probably greater productivity now than we did with that we probably had a pro where we're just making, uh, putting oxygen into to make ferric iron and sulfates. We probably had about, I guess it's a tenth of the productivity. Okay, so what you're suggesting is that four billion years ago, there was not much life, therefore there was not much nucleation, therefore there was not much clouds, therefore the albedo of the earth was controlled by the ocean, and the ocean is very dark, and that means it absorbed more light than it does now. Yes. So, so this the the needle of the Earth if used to be lower. At, and again, if we look at the Earth shine on the moon yeah. uh, with the equipment available to Galileo, uh -huh. it was very obvious to Galileo uh, that the western crescent uh, was over the Atlantic Ocean, okay. the eastern crescent was over the deserts, and the Earth shine when you, uh, Galileo looked east is much greater than the Earth shine when he looked west. And this is just using Galileo's naked eye. I think you probably had plenty, but I've never looked for it there. Okay. Now, in your in your research, what are the most important questions that you have answered? Uh, uh, starting with my career in chronological order, the first would be the asteroid impacts could have a large effect on life. Uh, they have a negative effect. Uh, they exterminate life. The pinprick attack at the end of the Cretaceous wiped out the dinosaurs. Uh, it killed uh, a large number of photosynthetic species also from fires of darkness. But let's talk about earlier. You were working on much earlier. Uh, so this got us the idea. We go back to the early Earth where these big basins were forming on the moon. Uh, the impacts could be large enough. Uh, if they wipe out everything, it's not interesting. The Titanic would not be an interesting uh, story if there was no radio and no survivors. We just uh, know it didn't reach port in New York and then the right. uh, ship would have been found with submersibles 70 years later. Yes. Uh, uh, which would be like digging up fossils, but we don't have fossils from that time. But if we have a few biota survive that become the ancestors of what follows, uh, the genome is effectively telling the story retold over four billion years. 
uh, but still a lot of the story left, that the ancestor of bacteria and archaea each appear to be a thermophile organism, which is exactly what would survive an ocean boiling impact down a kilometer or so where it's hot anyway, but doesn't get any hotter during the few thousand years at the surface. But you just, you just invoked, however, some distribution of thermophilia and then using impacts to create survivors that are hyperthermophilic. Yeah. But how about that original assumption? Maybe life started out hyperthermophilic for, for reasons that have to do with the Earth used to be hot in general, and then it cooled down, and then when it cooled down sufficiently enough, you would have hyperthermophiles first because that's the environment. And the Earth would stay in this thermophile state we calculated, again using the CO2 cycle, and it stays in it for a significant time, millions of years, maybe tens of millions if you push it, but it can't stay in that state for the whole or for the whole Hidea. That was just after the moon forming impact we're talking Just about? after the moon forming impact. We have to start out extremely hot. We get to climate, so we have to pass through the thermophile conditions. Yes. Uh, basically, the CO2 that's in the air after the impact has to be subducted uh, down to a level of a few bars from a like a hundred bars uh, to where the earth will become climate and it takes the earth will be thermophile uh, from kind of the time that the pressure is 25 bars down to where it's a few bars it takes millions of years to subduct that much of co2 so we're so, so this is abiotic subduction through where the carbonate silicate cycle where it's darn hot it's I darn <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay very good and so you were talking about your mo the the most important research, questions that you've answered. One is the effect of bombardment on life in the early universe. You talked about refuges, I think, and hyperthermophilia. Yes. Okay. And uh, uh, then this kind of hot cross, whether we started out cold. Again, the, these big impacts, we're only getting at most a few of them, what you could count on your hand. So there could be hundreds of millions of years between when life originates and when it gets uh, almost exterminated by an impact. Uh -huh. uh, again, something the research has come up, we don't have a precise time, but it's a long time. Hypothermophile organisms could evolve at the subsurface and then be the, the lucky survivors. Yes. Uh, then, then the molecular biologist has to take over, mm -hmm. look at things in the genome, in the chemical makeup of the organism, uh, which are complicated, and try to infer uh, whether the organism started out cold right, right, and that we right, had right. this hot cross. Right, right, right. Uh, we could do much better telling the common ancestor of the bacteria and the archaea, the, the first life, oh. or what would be Luca, which would now be the last common ancestor of both bacteria and and our okay. kale, which is not the first common cellular ancestor. Right. Do you have any idea about the difference between the origin of life and LUCA? How long a period that might have been? Uh, uh, that uh, could be, again, tens of millions a year, 100 billion years. 10 or 100 million years? We don't know. Probably. Not a billion. Probably not a billion. We can't fit a billion in there. We know that things teem with life by 3.8. And by 3.8, how long had it taken to get to that teeming with life? Can't you make an We estimate? don't know very well, but my guess is that the life is complex. It will take hundreds of, hundred million years or million years or more, but mm -hmm. we really uh, don't know. Okay, so we were talking about what important questions you've answered in your research. We've talked about now the bombardment and refuge. What else? Uh, we've... Uh, research uh, mainly by others, but pointing out that there are viable geochemical cycles before photosynthesis. Uh, when I was taught biology, biology kind of began with oxygen making photosynthetic organisms. We had to have primary producers. Uh, we know that in this rock, if water gets into it, there's energy from the reaction of the water and the rock uh, that life could use. We have modern organisms uh, that do not need the bounty of photosynthesis to live. 
Again, I've said there's no way on the earth that you can get away from the products of photosynthesis, uh, but the organisms living in water circulating through this type of rock uh, would be able to live perfectly well had the rock not been slightly contaminated uh, by photosynthesis of the metal. The organisms don't care about the isotopic ratio of U-238 to 235 right. or some subtle thing that a very skilled geochemist can measure that tell us that this rock contains life uh, that was the product of biology that's been subducted into the metal. Now, right now in this office, there is about 20% oxygen, and yeah. you and I are breathing it. Now, do you think that aerobic respiration in animals in general were evolved in order to have some type of buffer, but to buffer the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere that was being produced by the photos, oxygenic photosynthesis? Uh, if we're put on oxygen in the hospital, we do, we're sick anyway, but we don't immediately die from it. Uh, if, well, if we get a lot of oxygen in the air, rock rusts faster, and forest fires, again, like we've had in California, you're having now in Australia, uh, become much more prevalent. So it get, becomes harder for leafy plants to live because they catch fire. People have uh, looked at the Permian period uh, where we had insects as big as this room. Insects on the modern earth don't have particularly efficient ways to get oxygen out of the air like we do with big logs. Yes. Uh, so the idea is that we're maybe up to 30% or more oxygen then. Uh, back before we had lead plants, we may have been at right, uh, but, but what 5%. But what I'm asking is, there, do you think there's some type of regulation going on between the amount of aerobic respiration and the amount of oxygenic photosynthesis? Uh, there is, because, but it's complex. And other than the forest fires, it's not well understood. <laughs> okay. All right. And uh, any other questions that you've answered in your re research? Uh, we've uh, looked at the tectonics of Mars uh, some. Uh, maybe other people have done that. Mars was tectonically active early in its history. Uh, we've tried to wait, look. Wait, how early? Uh, probably before th three and a half billion. Uh, life could have easily got back and forth with meteorites. Uh, a modest-sized asteroid like happened at the end of the Cretaceous hits. Uh, there are no dinosaurs to wipe out that, but it ejects rocks into space. Uh, with it, uh, eight or ten bots, these rocks are falling on the other planet. Do you think that life on Earth came from Mars? I think it... Uh, that's a good chance of doing that. Unlike life starting on the Earth, you could go out on Mars. It's just hard to get there. Uh, but if you do get there, you could find rocks, plenty of them that are over 4 billion years old. Yes. The ALH meteorite that had possible biological signatures in, the paleomagnetists have looked at the detailed properties of the magnetite of the rock. The rock has never been heated above 40 degrees C. Uh, uh, the rock fell in Antarctica. The magnetite would have been reset if it fell uh, in Australia and lay on, a, on your desert during a hot day. Uh -huh. the, 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 this is how low. If you, this rock that's 3.8 billion years old at least twice has been up to 500 degrees C. We would never find we could just do the isotopes of the carbon. Mm -hmm. uh, we would never even hope to look for DNA in it. The rock sat at the surface, so it'd find DNA, but it'd be from modern biology. And uh, people would not bother doing that. Well, do you think that uh, if we're looking for life elsewhere, or, or if we're trying to find something about the origin of life on Earth, do you think we should look at the moon or Mars? Because the moon presumably is already useful for knowing the amount of asteroids that hit. Uh, we probably find a little bit of terrestrial life uh, that's been ejected. We know moon meteors hit the Earth, yeah. so uh, the Earth was showered with meteors at the end of the Cretaceous that were hucks of Earth rock. Yeah, but I'm talking and about four billion at, years uh, ago. Uh, four billion years ago, uh, we would probably find some, 
it would be a, uh, a very difficult search. We'd need a lot of debris from the moon. More, it's easier on the moon than on, the, on Mars? On Mars, we just find the rock in place. We find sedimentary uh, rocks that have sulfate in them, uh, could well be biological, uh -huh. uh, that are or, or, or overlanded. We see uh, uh, what would look like biology on the Earth where sulfur and iron have moved relative to right, but magnesium. I'm not, I'm not talking about Martian life. I'm talking about evidence of the origin of life on Earth from rocks on Earth that got sprayed into the outer. That, that would be better for the moon. Mars is just harder to hit. Right. Okay. If you're wanting to see life originate on Mars and see the Earth, if we find viable organism and it has 16S ribosomal RNA <laughs> like a terrestrial <laughs> organism, uh, we would know very quickly that the Earth and Mars exchange life, All right. and we don't have an independent origin. Now, what are the most important questions that you're trying to answer now? Uh, where I've looked some at the tectonics on the icy moons. Tectonics on the icy moons, what's the question you're trying to answer? Uh, j just how, how long they stay hot, how how material is brought from the surface. You mean Io, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto? Uh, Io and Europa mainly, huh. uh, where we have a strong active tectonics now, ice tectonics. Okay. So I've looked at the physics of ice on uh, the Earth. A lot of it's back, I think, in the camp of the molecular biologists. Mm -hmm. uh, I use their results. Uh, but I do not attempt to do that myself. All right. Now, here's one question for you. Uh, are we alone? Uh, I, I think certainly not. There are, we know now that there are uh, at least many billions of planets in the habitable zone in our own galaxy. Uh, there are trillions of planets. If you go in the whole universe, uh, many, there are uh, probably trillion, trillion of planets total, uh, some huge number in the observable universe. Uh, so uh, the chances of it being alone, uh, the reason that uh, the aliens in uh, science fiction and movies look like humans, it's easier to have humans yes. uh, 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 disguised as them. Yes. So in the question, are we alone, what does the word we mean to you? It could be two things, uh, microbial life, uh, complex life, uh, where we could film this video. How about viral life? That doesn't count? I, viral life counts. Uh, Is that we a don't really understand how viruses in total evolve. There may be different origins of viruses. Uh, we have RNA viruses and DNA viruses. Uh, uh, the viruses that we see are pathogens or symbionts. They, ha they need a cellular organism to live. Uh, well, don't all do cellular organisms need cellular organisms to live? All viruses that we know about need... No, no but all cellular life that we know about needs other cellular life to live as well. Kind of now, but at the first, there had to be a single first species. So you think that life can be defined by a cell wall, a cellularity? Not necessarily. The search for acellular uh, DNA and RNA to organisms has been almost not existent. If we go back 30 years and look at a tree of life, almost every microbial organism on it is a pathogen. Some person or animal got sick, and the uh, doctors and the biologists studied it. Yes. Uh, we have things like the Asgard uh, archaea uh, that were not on the tree of life then because nobody right. had looked for them. And uh, people have not looked for cellular life. If we start out with acellular life, there have been a uh, proposal that acellular life uh, originates in these white smoker chimneys. So they're basically like travertine. They have mesh, microscopic pores. Uh, they're as big as a microscopic cellular organism. 
Organism doesn't need to make a cell wall. It's got it for free. Do you think that's how life got started? Do you, do you have any favorite uh, uh, candidates? Uh, uh, that one and life originating on a uh, land are my, my two favorites. Is there, are there others? Uh, you, could ha you need some sort of chemical disequilibrium. You need to have the right build chemical building locks for life there. And you need some sort of energy source to maintain the cellular, you, to maintain the chemical disequilibrium. And those occur most anywhere we look on the earth. Well, an RNA world is a world without cells, presumably. What is the We don't know. W well, what about the, well. We know that there are RNA viruses. Right. right. We certainly don't have cells. But we talk about an RNA world as a, one of the uh, they could be in these. It could be in these kind of proto-cells in the travertine. I see. And this is a one science fiction way, uh, which is not molecular biological evidence now, to get viruses. Uh, the, the, these chimneys only last tens, hundreds of years. The chimney field may last uh, millennia, but short geological That's, time. Right, right. It's going to be the sea floor spreading or something equivalent to it. It's going to be off the ridge axis. If the organism's going to survive, it's going to have to disperse. Right. And one of the ways to disperse it is it could package its RNA or DNA in a protein packet, send a lot of these out, uh, like uh, plants, fish lay millions of eggs. So uh, even with modern cellular biota, sending a lot out is mm -hmm. not a problem. One of these will find a new chimney, colonize it. So you got something that looks a lot like a virus, but it's acting as a spore. Later on, when you get the cellular life, it finds a cellular organism and colonizes it rather than colonizing a two chimney. Now we got a traditional virus. Right. Uh, we don't know enough about viruses, but this is a potential path to get them. Okay. And we really don't know how viruses, many kinds of them, originated. All right, now, valuable information in here, but in the cap of the molecular biologist, okay. viruses do not generally leave fossil records. They don't fractionate isotopes in any way that you know of? That must be known, but not by me. Okay. Now, uh, when, when I asked you about are we alone, you said probably not because, and then you went on to list that there are many habitable planets in the universe. We probably are, uh, yeah, and we We're, have found one now that's already 100 life years from the Earth. Right, so, so let's just... Let's just accept that there are lots, billions and billions of these Earth-like planets with water on the surfaces. But that doesn't tell you that there's life there because we know so little about the origin of life. I guess you had to assume that the origin of life is easy in it, order to it, make that step. It occurs fast on the Earth compared to the age of the Earth, which is one of the traditional arguments for it be easy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the elements that I use are very common elements on the Earth. Yes. If it was using some odd rare earth right. or, uh, uh, or plutonium that's extremely right. rare. So ingredients are common. Common. That's, and uh, it happened. Chemical disequilibria are common. Starlight is common. Internal energy from the interior of a planet is common. Right. Uh, and so we're not using anything in particular. Uh, the dish. Uh, to go from a photosynthetic life to photosynthetic life. There's modern life uh, that's uh, electrotrophic. It eats electrical currents. Uh, there's, you take an ordinary zinc sulfide crystal, sphalerite, common, relatively common mineral. There are microbes that could sit on it at the, and eat the electrical current from it acting as a photoelectric cell. So it, the idea of an electrotrophic origin of life, where it's all of it like photosynthetic, but uh, really electrotrophic. There's microbes, uh, there are archaea and uh, bacteria that will send wi biological wires between different uh, right. cells that uh, effectively act, allow the consortium of cells to act as a uh, a battery or a photocell, depending on how you want to think about it. So, so would you agree with Christian de Duve when he says that life is a cosmic imperative? I wouldn't go as far as a comparative, but I would say it's something that has to be extremely likely. If we find life on Mars that's not, 
that's really independent of life on Earth and not exchanged. We know life is everywhere. If we find simple life on Europa or Enceladus that's not exchanged, where exchange is difficult, we know life is everywhere. Now, you're using the word life quite a bit here. Do you have any type of understanding of what life is? Uh, it's somewhat like uh, going out on a research project to find the world's smallest giant. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly when something becomes life and non-life is semantic. Uh, we know we have life. So that means that there's no boundary, you think? Or? There's a boundary between life and non-life. Th there's something called threshold theory uh, that if you have... Uh, non-life and nascent life, it's almost life. The nascent life is having to compete with the non-life. The non-life is doing the same chemical reactions uh, that uh, produce, uh, release energy, favorable energy that the life is trying to do. But uh, uh, once the life reaches a threshold uh, where it can outcompete the non-life, meaning it can gather energy, gather resources, uh, and disperse, uh, it will be very quickly become extremely abundant. Why do you uh, conceptualize that as a threshold? Why not a continuum? It is a continuum, but once you pass a certain point in the continuum, the winner wins. The winner wins. Uh, it will very quickly... In every connected environment, you get these thresholds that produce threshold bottlenecks. The first organism uh, that can efficiently do photosynthesis where it doesn't need molecular hydrogen uh, it could use uh, ferrous iron and sulfide, sulfide, excuse me, that are abundant, becomes extremely abundant. Okay. Uh, we go from the small amount of nascent life eking out its living uh, to something that's a winner it goes to all co connected environments very quickly, and then the additive radiation. Now, I asked you the starts. question. I asked you the question: Are we alone? And you said probably not. Yes. Now, is this an important question? And if so, why? It's a philosophical question that's gone on uh, since science. It's the uh, development of modern science. Giordano Bruno was the first person to clearly pose the problem. He obviously did not solve it. He was burned to a stake. Uh, uh, the, the church could live uh, with a few intellectuals in Europe that could understand the Copernican system. It could not live with the earth not being special and life uh, living everywhere else in the universe. Uh, and uh, Galileo uh, posed to uh, follow the water. He was careful to discuss the mood so he could have a, a negative example. Wait, wait. I asked you about why this question is important, and you're now telling me about some it history. It drove the origin of modern science. It drove the origin of modern science. The first question of, of new science was astrobiology uh, with Galileo. I didn't know Galileo was interested in that. He was interested, but he had to keep fairly quiet. He s suffered from pyrophobia. Wait so, <laughs> so wait, so you think Galileo asked himself the question, are we alone? He certainly did. How do you know that? He actually discusses life on the moon. A lot of people discuss life on the moon in very science fiction-y kind of hand-waving. But he's discussing it in science ways. In what ways? Uh, there's no water on the moon. He does no... No clouds, no water, no life. Uh huh. So he was. He did not understand that life could live in the interior of a body. Uh -huh. The moon is so dry. There's probably no water. The too little water in the interior anyway. Okay. Do you think he thought life was on Jupiter or something, or on the Jupiter moons, Galilean moons? Uh, he, he like he knows. He could safely because. The opponents of the Copernican system had brought up the sun and the astronomical unit, the distance between the Earth and sun is light scales. So he actually attempts to measure the disk angle of Vega, 
unsuccessfully because you're not going to have the right equipment. Right. Okay. You you could measure uh, the disc angle of Antares and Aldebaran All right. uh, with the naked eye. Uh huh. If you get a very grazing occultation. Oh. You need good astronomy, so you don't. You have to know exactly which kilometer to stand in. Okay. Now, as astrobiology is somehow a scientific story of genesis of how we got here. It's kind of like a very big picture thing. Do you think that studying that makes you a better person? Like the examined life is worth living, the unexamined life is not. As a, personally, for example, you do astrobiology. Think how does that change the way you behave? I wrote a a web book for astrobiology for liberal arts majors, uh -huh. for serious liberal arts majors, not science folk. Yes. Uh, science has driven the change of worldview, and the change of worldview has driven science. The worldview before Bruno did not allow this question to arise in the Western world. Uh, the worldview, particularly after Galileo, Galileo was suppressed, but his uh, best as he got everywhere. Harvard uh, toyed with trying to get him over and hired him. They realized it was not practical. But if you're going to start a, the first university of the New World, uh -huh. speaking New World, Galileo was somebody you would try to get. Uh, chemistry, uh, physics, uh, and modern biology are all things that come into astrobiology. Astrobiology applies all the modern sciences. And uh, the uh, modern astronomy, the uh, ability to determine the distance to the stars. Uh, with the naked eye, uh, you can get the disk angle of the stars. If you assume that Terry is, is sun-like, which it isn't, yeah. uh, you, you get that the stars are at least 800,000 astronomically units away, and you can't see parallax, annual parallax with the naked eye. But now, I asked you the question, is this scientific story important, and now you're saying science is important. Science is important. The astrobiology uh, drove uh, initially the origin of modern science. I see. And we have the uh, we get different things are coming in at different times. Mm -hmm. The question of the origin of life, uh, we had ready in Renaissance Italy that show, showed that flies originate from other flies, yeah. <laughs> eggs and maggots, rather than from, uh, from rotting meat as spontaneous generation. Okay. So uh, with uh, Pasteur, it showed that microbes uh, originate from other microbes, not from decaying organic matter. Okay. And, and to Pasteur, the origin of microbes was not really a problem because a large number of people just thought they originated anyway. You mentioned this web book. Is yes. It, it's on the web? Do you have it's on the web. People log into my site. There's a link to it. Okay. Do they log into your website. They just Google your name or... Google by day, go to, it'll come up, Norm Sleep's homepage, uh -huh. Norm Sleep's homepage. Yes. A cl click on the, or, or on the homepage, there's obvious links to the class of the astrobiology book. Now, do you have any advice for students who are thinking about becoming astrobiologists? Uh, my path uh, was I, I do other s sciences with astrobiology science. Astrobiology as a specific discipline did not exist. Uh, at the time that I tried to first publish in Nature on uh, the effect of asteroid impacts on life, uh, the paper was sent to classical biologists who came back, among other things, that the Hadean was defined by definition as lifeless, so it was irrelevant to speculate on life. <laughs> until we have proven Hadean fossils, which of course don't exist. Uh, which put it basic, I, I pointed this out to the Nature editors and they said the reviews were off base, uh, but they're going to reject it anyway, which, okay. <laughs> and so the 89 paper, you do the best thing uh, for against dogmatism is to quantify things. We had a quantified paper uh, with many authors uh, the distinction between first common ancestor 
of life, and last common ancestor had it suck in really into our minds yet. Uh, the need to have a viable ecosystem for life to originate, just not conditions where one organism could survive briefly, had suck in. We quantified the uh, impact uh, rate on life, the difference between the Earth and Moon. Of course, better calculations have been done. Okay. But this was the start. So, but, but we're talking about advice to students who are thinking about becoming uh, astrobiologists. I, I would. Uh, there's a practical thing of employment uh, that if you are, your specialty is, is geochemistry, you you could be in the regular department. Uh, do the astrobiology. Uh, uh, but have the expertise in one of the derivative things that astrobiology is derivative on. Uh, uh, there are uh, places uh, like Caltech, JPL, where you're essentially doing it full time. Uh, so uh, there are various paths, but you need a strong background, uh, obviously in math. Uh, you, I do not have a strong background in molecular uh, biology, uh, that helps strong background in the geology, geochemistry, tectonics. Mm -hmm. If you're doing other planets, strong background, if you're going to be detecting it, uh, strong background in how light is actually absorbed in atmospheres, uh, what you see. So there are a lot of people doing a lot of different things now. At astrobiologists, astrobiology conference is big now. It's no longer like in the rare earth paper uh, where the authors could quote about 10 people, including themselves, that were actively doing. It's a big, large field. Hopefully, we'll have astrobiota soon. <laughs> we'll have astrobiota? I Confirmed said. astrobiota, yeah. <laughs> okay. It's, it's right. a field that's scientific, uh, but it's not yet uh, conclusively found life on another planet, even though I expect within the lifetime of the other people, uh, we will get uh, at least fossil evidence for Mars. If we, okay. uh, ALH meteorites are like about a piece of it, it's not particularly big. Mm -hmm. And if we had tons of it, uh, it would be gone through in great detail and if there was true evidence of uh, Martian life in it, it would have been already found. Mm -hmm. You just don't want to sacrifice your one rock that's this big. What better techniques may be available in 10 or 20 years? Or, what, are, what do you think are the biggest misconceptions that your colleagues here at Stanford or the scientists in general or students have about astrobiology? It's not like when I first started where you were having to fight that you're doing astrology. There, and we don't have to fight that uniformitarianism requires things in geology always to proceed a, a pace that would be too slow for snails. <laughs> uh, people know that asteroids have hit the Earth. The uh, meteor crater, where that was understood, kind of shifted things. Uh, the early Apollo program was planned that they thought the senior scientists all thought that the craters were volcanic. Mm. By about the third mission, when they could, fourth mission, when they could start changing things, they knew they were, everybody knew there were impacts. I see. But they, they did good science on the early missions, even though they had the, uh, their concepts wrong. So you could, science can proceed where you don't fully understand. Now you're talking about misconceptions in the past. What about today? What are the misconceptions that are most common? Uh, among the... Uh, public that we're going to find little green beds suddenly and stuff. Among scientists, uh, the, I, the biologists are, are getting better understanding. Uh, I was not that long ago, I, I was speaking at a conference that had a large number of biologists, and somebody asked, why don't you go back and get a four billion year old rock and just look at the DNA in it. <laughs> okay. uh, I just explained the uh, Earth is like a library in a dark age where you've lost the ability to uh, get paper from trees and if they need more paper, 
Uh, they have to take the old paper and grind it up and get new paper. You have illiterate people grabbing pages to make new paper to kind of do records. Mm -hmm. After four billion years of this, uh, you don't have many pages arranging from the uh, right. original records. It, the Earth is like that. So uh, the misconception of the Earth, uh, there, there's some, the misconception that you need oxygenated life to have uh, oxygen photosynthesis to have life is pretty well uh, disappeared. I see. Okay. So it's there's a lot that's not understood. There are people that will do something uh, very specialized. I saw a talk uh, where they were doing prebiotic chemistry in the lab with ruthenium, which is a platinum-like element that's quite rare. Uh, and uh, so it turned out the people had not thought about whether you could actually get uh, ruthenium metal on the early Earth. Ruthenium? Ruthenium, ruthenium yeah. yeah. Ruthenium, okay. I, I'm forgiving an American pronunciation. <laughs> ruthenium, okay. is that's the Australian pronunciation. I, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know which one it is either. It's a rare enough right, element. Right. That proves the point. <laughs> but, so th this is one of the things we... Uh, drove me to look to see which things on the early Earth could be abiotic, that you have the oxygen around you that's clearly biological. You can't have abundant oxygen at a root to, to form life. Yes, yes. And w w so we went through a large number uh, of things. We, I got to legitimately cite my grandfather who studied the tall grass prairie in the western United States. Uh -huh. And the question there was whether the tall grass prairie uh, was human managed by the Native Americans. Over a century ago, this was a very unpopular topic, and he had uh, relegated himself to being the starting faculty of the biology department of a small teacher's college. But that's become quite popular now on what is really wilderness. Uh huh, I see. And a large number of things that were thought to be wilderness by the Europeans were actively heavily managed by the Native Americans. Right. And we have the same thing that we can't, the earth has been so affected by biology. Yes. As somebody proposes a biological environment for, to get uh, things started, we have to ask. Is that environment on the modern Earth dependent on biology? Yes, yes. And, uh, That's a hard question to answer, I It's imagine. a hard question to answer. There are things like the white smoke or serpentine that's almost certain on the early Earth, uh. but something like ruthenium metal is much more iffy. There's definitely not going to be a lot of it, mm -hmm. okay, uh, now but let me, to let a me... microbe, uh, piece of rock this big is huge. <laughs> Let me ask you another question. Um, what, do you have a favorite solution to Fermi's paradox? Uh, my fa uh, uh, favorite one is a stability solution, uh, uh, at a, at a, which uh, a society that survives is going to have a visceral fear of exponential growth. Uh, that they know they can't have exponential growth on their whole planet. They found a solution for that. They're not going to release a plague of machines for the Neumann paradox or a plague of colonists that are going to exponentially grow on a galaxy they're going to plan to live in. Uh, the other one comes from Larry Devon, uh, which is if you uh, plan to go to Alpha Centauri, and it's going to take 10,000 years. You have to have a huge spaceship where you reproduce out of the way. Uh, in 5,000 years, you could be overtaken. I see. But somebody that figures out how to get a much larger fraction of the speed of light and get there in 50 years. Now, if, if uh, I gave you $100 billion and asked you, you have to spend this to help answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? I would do Mars thoroughly. Mars thoroughly. We could get a lot of rovers up there for a hundred uh, billion. Okay. Now, do you think uh, there? Are... Get a few astronauts up there. We contaminate it. Now, 
you wouldn't invest in electron microscopes to look for our nano aliens? Probably not. We don't know what nano aliens are. I would uh, <coughs> spend money to look for free living DNA and RNA. How about, uh, do you think, you know, there are neurons in your head right now that do not know that they're part of a life form. Do you think we could be part of a life form and not know it? Uh, possibly, but it gets so far into science fiction <laughs> okay. that it becomes, un we could be, definitely be in Fermi Zoo, but it becomes untestable. What kind of aliens would you like to find? Peaceful ones. <laughs> yeah, I, it, we're likely, to, if we find aliens, they've been around for a much longer time than we have, and they will not be interested in us to eat. Uh, they'll be interested in our sociology, our science. Uh, they'll be uh, mainly interested in our observational science. It will be a lot easier for them to get telemeter detailed descriptions of how the earth is working than it will be for them to actually send somebody here. Okay. Now, in the next 10 to 20 years, where do you think most progress will be made in astrobiology? I think we'll, we'll get sample returns for bars, and hopefully they'll be useful. We when should you be, say useful, you mean that it might have uh, life on them? If we get abiotic rock like this. Yeah, that would not be useful. It'd be useful for the petrologists and not be useful for astrobiology. Right. We already know Mars is a planet with basaltic volcanism. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, with the uh, molecular biology, uh, uh, do uh, groups of life, uh, manganese uh, using photosynthesis has been found. Uh, it's the bridgehead to get oxygen photosynthesis. If you get an old biology book, and not very old, it'll tell you manganese cannot be used to dump oxygen. Oh. Uh, so we'll get many more of these thing, things where new, great new clads of organisms are found. Uh, we pretty well know that eukarya are not a domain of life. They're a, 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 the central genes are kale. Uh, they've captured bacterial uh, Sibiet and a lot of the Sibiet genes have jumped into the nucleus. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's complicated, uh, but we have much better understanding of it now than we did even 10 years ago. So there are vast number of things coming out of the molecular biology. Uh, uh, we will we'll probably get images of planets. We may find a planet Earth-like habitable zone with oxygen atmosphere. Uh, once these things are found, the incentive uh, to spend uh, billions of dollars to do better uh, because uh, the public is interested. Uh, we had the rover land on Mars, and people filled the Smithsonian area, the grassy areas around the facility, to watch it on large screen. People were watching it on live TV. Mm -hmm. it, uh, the whole project cost less than one science fiction movie to get the real thing. So the expense if we, for non-human exploration is, is small. Yeah. Uh, there's, uh, we do, uh, Mars life may be very well related to human life. If we get E. coli, we know it's a contaminant. Uh, we don't know if Mars life is related to Earth life, and we certainly don't know when, the, when it branched off. So we may find clads of organisms that are related to Earth organisms that, let's say, don't have the 16th S ribosomal RNA, or it's so different we don't immediately recognize it. So we don't want to bring back a contaminated sample. Sending humans up there. Uh, when we're after the, something less than a nanogram of organic matter that was obviously biologic, even though dead, a molecular fossil would be a discovery of the century. If we find a live organism, it would be the discovery of the, the uh, millennia. It would be regarded in the year 3000 uh, as one of the major discoveries still. And 
uh, we said along tons of unneeded contaminants. It's, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. <laughs> okay, so let me ask you again. Are, we're almost, are we alone? Uh, my guess is we're not, but we may not find out that we're, for, for organi microorganisms, we will probably find that out in the lifetime of your younger viewers. Uh, for contacting uh, somebody uh, that could use this camera, uh, we may, not, may or may not uh, find it out. We have uh, no good information of how long civilizations last. We know we could just self-destroy, uh, uh, but we, uh, we've managed to avoid that for a while. Uh, we have still have major political parties in, in, uh, in industrialized countries that have rejected science. Uh, I am optimistic and hopeful, but we don't know yet. 